Hello everyone, my name is Juliette Campasse. I'm the Learning Solutions Project Executive here at the Institute and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You've joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dialing information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to Nick by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. It's my great pleasure to introduce Rod Jones, the content manager here at the Institute. Hello, Rod, and over to you. Hello, Juliet, and thank you for your introduction. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Nick Mayhew, who is the Managing Director of Alembic Strategy. Nick Mayhew is founder and owner of management consultancy Alembic Strategy, where he leads the strategy, change and mergers and acquisitions work, as well as offering strategic coaching. Alembic Strategy fulfills a lifelong passion of Nick's for helping people, especially leaders and their organisations, who want to be better. Okay, over to you, Nick. Thank you very much, Rod. Thank you very much uh, for letting me uh, do this webinar for you. So uh, the title of the show today is Be Resilient, uh, which I've picked out uh, for a reason, which you'll come to understand in a second. So we're going to be talking about the physical habits that build resilience and protect you from becoming overwhelmed. Um, I'm going to cover that in uh, a couple of chapters. So chapter one is going to talk about the problem. Uh, we're going to be talking about the body brain. We're going to talk about the sort of chemical soup that our brain sits in and just ask the question about just how toxic that is and then reflect on what suffering really is. Just to sort of set the framework for the discussion about how resilience can be helpful. And then in chapter two of the webinar, I've got seven simple solutions for you. So we're going to look at being selfish to serve others better, many modes of mindfulness, uh, a couple of ideas um, which are maybe new to you. So one is about lungfulness, one is about heartfulness, one is about dealing with the distractions of nighttime, um, being strict, so strictly, and then tackling those bad habits. And then at the wrap up, I'm hoping for some questions. So please fire your questions at me. I'm pleased to answer them. Um, and I think we're going to be going for about 20 minutes and then there'll be some questions. So I think there's a poll now for everybody. The poll is now open. We're gathering the responses. Okay, I think the majority has voted. The results are on the screen. So we have 63% your own resilience, 28% general interest, 9% colleague resilience, and 0% other people's resilience. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Really interesting that it's, um, you know, such a personal issue for so many of you. And I think that just is the truth. Uh, let me just um, tell you a little bit about about why it's relevant for me to give this presentation. Um, had a wonderful introduction there from Rod and um, Alembic. My business is um, a partnership with uh, the Institute of Leadership and Management. We think they're wonderful and use their services to help um, develop our leaders. Um, but you can see a little bit there about me. I think the most important thing to tell you is I have a sort of strange upbringing, which includes a long period of life um, living in a Buddhist center, Buddhist community. So my dad was a Buddhist and uh, we were meditating since uh, as early as I can remember, sort of four or five years old. And uh, I used to do Tai Chi and Qigong after school playing rugby um, and, you know, really personally got the experience of how uh, moving from a Welsh rugby pitch in the afternoon, coming home feeling exhausted and then doing Tai Chi and Qigong in the evening completely reset my mind, the way I was feeling about things. And so 
although I spent a lifetime in practice in the chartered accountancy practice, Alembic sort of fulfills that purpose around people. And what we bring to people is the sense that you can manage your mindset and your competency and your capability through, through your body. And so we use all those things. And I guess it's also meaningful to say that in my family, we've had significant genetic Ill illness, which um, has been hugely challenging. So, you know, like the rest of you, I'm not uh, sitting here preaching, but um, just talking to you from 50 years of my experience of dealing with challenges that we have, that many people have. Nothing new there, but um, I, I know from personal experience how um, overwhelming life can be at times. So let's just get into this and start talking about, you know, what it is for you and for people around you. So this problem. Um, and the thing is that life just throws challenges at us. Um, we all know that. We all know they're coming. We just don't know what they will be, when they will be or how big they will be. But we do know they're coming. And I guess this goes in two different directions. You know, you can have um, challenge on a daily basis. So, for example, you might be someone who's working in a pretty difficult environment at work. So let's say it's a toxic environment and there's a lot of challenge there. And that builds up and builds up and builds up. And then how many additional challenges does it take to just push you or colleagues over the edge? I'm sure you've felt that and seen that in yourself and in others from time to time. So what is resilience? Um, I guess the question is when we're experiencing those challenges, it's how we cope that counts. And so when we talk about building up resilience, we're really talking about building up our ability to tolerate the strongest feelings. We can all tolerate difficult feelings to a degree. So really we're talking about here for you personally or for your colleagues, when those feelings become more difficult to manage, so at the higher levels. So it's our ability to tolerate those strong feelings without losing our ability to continue to function effectively. And so really we're talking about resilience as a sort of brain body resource for coping. Um, and I'm sure you've all come across this, but just a few examples from our clients' lives. One of my clients is a long standing managing director of a pretty uh, big company one day came into work and went blind in one eye. He'd had a, had a minor stroke, it turned out, uh, and that stroke sort of pointed at uh, serious heart disease, which uh, needed an immediate operation. And I think he thought he was going on fine for 15 years as MD, and then on that moment in that day, realized that his life as he had been leading it couldn't continue in that way and he needed to change. Um, and um, the challenge of that for him was, um, okay, fine, I know I need to change my ways. Uh, I know I can't live life as I have been living it, uh, but I don't know what my new life is going to be like. And so the emotional pressure of still coming into work, still being the MD, still you know, trying to look invulnerable to all of his colleagues, and yet um, being terrified of being... Uh, alone in case he had another occurrence and no one would capture him. You know, that's the sort of thing I think that we're talking about here. Can you cope with the pressures of life as a leader while health or of you or health of others around you is, is, um, is hit? Uh, so, so really that's what we're talking about. How can you cope and still continue to function effect effectively when, when the emotional overwhelm is so high uh, as in those circumstances? So I like to think of resilience as a physical resource that I can, I can build. And I chose the title Be Resilient to emphasize what's often missed, which is the body. So resilience is not completely about the mind. It's about the whole of the body brain, as it were. So obviously the body and the brain cannot be separated. You know, they are one thing. Um, they exist in here in this body. This body really is our true home. It's where we live, wherever we go, we're in the body. And when mental health and when resilience are being talked about, we're really talking about becoming emotionally overwhelmed in the face of our challenges. So let's just double down on what that means. The way we are feeling um, in these moments of pressure, and you all know what I mean. So it can come at you suddenly where some comment comes out of the blue and you feel triggered by it. It might be something that your partner says on the way out in the morning, which is a bit sharp and a bit contemptuous. 
and you feel it you feel that reaction in your body you feel it immediately and that might make you then start to think about it to ruminate about it to turn it over in your mind during the day so it's the way we are feeling and it's affecting our behavior and our thoughts so we're really talking about something physical so here it's important um, and it's an often missed point if your body is really low it affects your thoughts if your body is really low it affects your resilience so it doesn't always start with the thoughts, although that's how it's generally talked about, because whatever brings you down physically will affect you mentally. So, for example, you've probably experienced how eating bad food can make you feel and how that affects your ability to cope with the consequences. And after a big night out, for example, how do you feel tired and hungover and you feel awful, right? So even you probably don't get too much done on days where you've got a bad tummy or you know, you're hungover from, from a big night out. We are innately connected to the world in here and out there through our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. They're key to our immunity, which is also related to resilience. And really here we're talking about living a healthy life and how that builds our resilience over time and how not living a healthy life destroys our resilience over time. So in the moment it can seem fine, but these little things build up over time into something big, uh, like my colleague who had the stroke. So there's a key leadership point here. Healthy living permeates and helps those around us and unhealthy living does the same thing. So just go back to that basic point. When we talk about resilience, we're really talking about building up our ability to tolerate the stronger feelings without losing our ability to continue functioning correct, uh, effectively. And we're also talking about building our health and our immunity. So emotions, exist in this sort of soup inside us so i've called it a brain soup and then you know sometimes that's sometimes and for some people that soup can become toxic feelings are generated by hormones which are chemical and their responses to our environment those get combined with neurotransmitters hormones and neurotransmitters are heavily involved in the creation of memory so that thought about something that happened to me. That's a memory which we're having now, ruminating on something that happened in the past. That memory is a stimulus. So it's also part of our environment. And we can stimulate our own emotions with our own thoughts, with our own memories, especially if they're emotional and then we ruminate about them. And there's a few of the chemicals and hormones involved in the process right there at the bottom. So. It's all part of the same system. And the problem with humans is our ability to think about things can also stimulate um, our reaction to things and keep the uh, challenge physically going for us. So really what I'm saying here is all suffering is physical. We do it in here. We do it in the body. And just to truly try and make that point, I'm just going to say excitement is energizing. You all know that. Anxiety is exhausting. You all know that. And that's the point, really. So everyone says mindset. Mindset is key to resilience, and it is. But we all know that when we're physically exhausting, uh, exhausted, it's just how hard it is to keep that mindset under control and just how easy it is to lose that determination. Okay, so that sets the scene. And I'm sure you've all got questions, so please fire them in. So let's just move on to seven simple solutions. Now, you may disagree with me, but these have all worked for me, so I heartily recommend them to you. And um, if you've got any questions about how to use them and what to do with them, I mean, hopefully they're pretty straightforward and quite practical. So number one, be selfish to serve. We do a leadership podcast each month called Strategy Cafe. It's on iTunes and YouTube, and I'm going to give you the links to it a little bit later. And you can find it on our website. The most recent one is with the CEO of the Institute of Leadership Management, uh, Phil James. Well worth a listen. One of the ones that we did recently was with Rebecca Hilsenrath, who's CEO at the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. And it was on, uh, she was on in December, and she talks about um, being selfish to serve as part of her leadership. The way she puts it is, it's like an emergency on airplane. You must first put on your own oxygen mask. You cannot save your family and fellow passengers if you are out of the game. So one of the most important things about being resilient is that it's built every day and it's built by nobody else but us. You have to build time for your resilience building activities and then your energy will grow day by day. And if your energy is good, then it's not just you that benefits from that. 
many people find this kind of quite a hard concept and they sacrifice their energy for those around them but ultimately that's a self-defeating uh, strategy uh, for us and for those that we care for and maybe for those that we lead putting yourself first can lead to accusations of selfishness from others and even from yourself when that negative thought can get in the way of doing what you need to be doing which is good for you and good for those around you and if that negative thought prevents you that's a problem so my first shout is to be selfish put yourself first build your energy and then you will find that you can serve better the next point is that mindfulness which is often talked about so my, my experience of this is there's just not one way of doing it and people find sometimes being, find sitting down in the lotus position meditating really really difficult and so therefore it's not a great way to do it if you understand what you're really doing when you're being mindful, then you'll find you can do it in all sorts of different ways. And really, it's just about connecting uh, something that you um, do naturally in your body with your thoughts so that your thoughts and your body come into sync. And the common way to do it is through the breath. So what you do is you think about the breath and that connects your thoughts to something physiological and natural. It synchronizes you with the parasympathetic nervous system pretty quickly. It synchronizes you with the unconscious pretty quickly and it distracts you and it brings you back into the body in a place of calm. You can do it walking, you can do it standing, you can do it climbing, you can do it running, you can do it praying, you can do it meditating, you can do it with yoga, you can do it sitting down at the office. So really don't get hung up with meditation. Mindfulness is really about taking a moment to connect the breath with the body and from that place of calm, as you practice it, it gets easier and you get better. You can then expand your awareness to connect with the world around you, what you hear, what you see, what you feel, what you smell, maybe what you're even tasting. And just spending a bit of time with that will take you out of your thoughts and back to the now and to the world that you're actually in. It's a great resource, a place of peace that quiets the thoughts, fills the soul and builds the habit over time. My next key point is lungfulness. So this is about exercise. It can be aerobic or anaerobic. It doesn't really mind, matter. The main point here is to breathe vigorously enough to make you breathe hard without fainting. So what does that do? It fills the brain with energy, oxygen, and with positive emotion, those various neurochemicals. And it also clears out the lymph system and sweats out all the gunk. So it's really good at recycling the toxins that we build up in our body. And even just three deep and vigorous breaths, again, don't faint, can make you feel better and ready for action. So it doesn't matter what you do, you can run, you can box, you can cycle, you can do interval training, but the main thing is to push your body a little bit more strongly than usual so that you're having to breathe vigorously. It will fill your lungs with oxygen, which will just make you sparkle again. So if you're feeling flat, and you're feeling a bit slow at work or you're feeling a bit overwhelmed, then a great shout is to go for a vigorous walk and take some deep breaths while you're out doing it. My next point really is about, I call it heartfulness, it's about putting the positive emotions back into your life. So here I said put the heart spices back into your brain soup, which is a great way to capture it. So the key point here is if you want love, be loving. If you want friends, be friendly. If you want joy, be joyful. And if you want laughter, laugh. Uh, the great thing about emotions is that they are catchy. The negative ones are catchy and the positive ones are catchy. And, you know, that same point, we can even catch them from ourselves. So it's not a tit for tat world. Don't get stuck into expecting a fair trade here. The secret to being the emotion you want more of is that it builds up that feeling around you and comes back a thousand fold and most importantly in how you feel about yourself so if you can get over that sort of awkward barrier about this concept of loving yourself or the bits of yourself that you don't love so much and practice love without expectation what you'll find is you start to see more love you see more friendship you see more joy you see more laughter and then that process just opens up the door to that becoming more in your life. So the trick here is if you want more of this in your life, just do more of it. This slide is really about the nighttime distraction. So many of you, if you're suffering from over anxiety, will have problems with sleep. And it turns out, just talking about the physiological nature of resilience, that sleep is absolutely critical. 
to building that resilience resource. So the first point here is to invest in sleep. Don't burn it for work. It's such a temptation, especially with busy lives to burn it, both burn the candles at both ends. Don't do that. Sleep is really fundamental and very important. Next tip, it's pretty straightforward stuff, but go to bed well. The sleep routines really work, so follow the sleep routines. Pay attention to late night drinking because late night alcohol keeps your sympathetic nervous system on even if you're passed out, you're not really properly asleep and it will stop you from recovering. So don't drink late. Uh, stop drinking way before bedtime. The smartphones have to go out of the room. You all know that, get rid of them. You need to manage the light. Uh, so the light needs to be low. And during the day, you need to have sunlight in your life. So make sure during the day you take time outside in the sun, outside in the natural world. If you can, just go outside for a bit each day. Don't stay in the office. Don't stay in the unnatural lighting because that then encourages the right rhythm to your body, which is the natural rhythm. And then if you do wake up, you know, the hormones hit your body and you wake up with uh, an adrenaline surge, with an anxiety surge. The trick here is to realize that those hormones will get recycled after about 10 minutes, provided you stop stimulating them. So when you do wake up, you must then distract yourself from the negative feelings. So do something to distract yourself and get your mind off the topic. I find affirmations are really good. If this happens to me, um, uh, it's all gonna be fine. I'm fine, things are great, things are going well. We all have our worries, but just simple repetitive statements said with enough passion for a few minutes in the you know in your own mind can be enough just to give you that 10 minute break and you'll find the hormones have gone the stress has gone down a whole level and you can probably go to sleep okay but if not just get up and redo the sleep routine from scratch and uh, you should get back up okay and then my last point here is called strictly which is um that actually practicing self-discipline uh, is really vital and is by repeating activities that we train our body dra uh, brain in new things. Resilience can be learned. You know, we have to practice to create the physical abilities. And this is about exposing our body brain to the challenging feelings and being with them for a little bit longer. So I'm not saying this is a prescription for a hair shirt, uh, everybody. Studies show that we give ourselves a little bit of a treat, uh, even a bit of cake as opposed to a bit of celery. Uh, our ability to maintain discipline through tough feelings lasts a little bit longer. But it's just practicing, you know, waiting, deferring, avoiding that impulse, doing our choice, pushing ourselves, chores, doing our, pushing ourselves a little further and concentrating for a little longer. Um, we'll build the ability to um, uh, be um, resilient uh, when the tough times hit. So this is all about building the right habits. Um, you all do things habitually. You can all think of many habits that you have right now. I certainly can. So we can all certainly do habits. Habits is a thing that just comes with the kit, right? It's a natural part of being a human being. We can all do habits. So I'm just going to say to you at the end of the session, apply some of that ability to do habits, which is by practicing and repeating things to your chosen set of resilience building practices and your resilience resource will build up over time. And so will your capacity for life every day, as well as the challenges to come. So double rewards. What do we get if we nail this? Well, we get healthier and fitter. We can be calmer under pressure. We have more energy. We experience our feelings more fully. We get more from life. We can be have more fun and be more fun to be around. There's less physical stress. There's more self-esteem in it. There's more confidence in it. There's better sleep in it. And the studies show that we live longer because it has a fundamental effect on our immunity and our long-term health. So that's it from me. I hope you found that useful. I'm really happy to take questions. I'm just gonna point you at some slides for where you can connect with us. But just while I'm doing that, think about, you know, what's the one thing that you're gonna act on from today's webinar? What's the one thing? Um, if you want a reading list, just get in touch and I can send you some books to read on this. I've stayed off the academics, but it's all there in the background. So if you want to have a look at them, please just send me an email and I'll send you a reading list so you can dig deeper. Come and hear Phil James. He's talking at our Meaningful Human Leadership Conference on the 12th of June. This wonderful chap um, who is the CEO of your institute. Um, and he was on our Strategy Cafe uh, Leadership Interview podcast and YouTube channel 
just last week so we'll send you the links uh, at the end of the show but you can find that here and go and listen to Phil he's very interesting he's got great things to say um, so there's the link for him which will come to you shortly and then there's a link to other speakers clips at conference he's going to be talking about meaningless and inhuman leadership and the point he makes is that it's very easy to get lost in the stats and the stats are really important but when you're looking at people in business none of those people is a statistic each one of those people is a human being with an individual and unique story and we mustn't forget that um, institute members get a discount for the conference and additional team members can come half price and we've got some amazing keynote speakers so we'd love you to come um, please do come along that's me done okay thank thank you nick we do have a number of questions i don't think we'll be able to answer all of them but hopefully people will be able to email them to you or to the institute and we can oh, get back to them. yeah yes please yes delighted oh, that's excellent thank you uh, the, the, one, the first question that came through it is an interesting one when you know that someone does something on purpose to trigger you yeah how do you prepare for being in their company in the future yeah, so difficult, isn't it? And we can create um, a sort of um, a, a habit of who people are. Um, when we've had a couple of negative experiences, it's a natural thing for a human being to remember that very strongly and very powerfully. And then uh, we only have to think about that person to start to re-experience the feelings uh, that we have. So, um, what we talk about here is um, being aware of our own response in connection with this negative stimulus. So um, maybe you can't do too much about somebody else's behavior, but what you can manage is your own. And the curious thing about that is if you change your own behavior, sometimes it affects the other person's behavior too, because they have to respond. They can't not respond to you changing. So um, that's just a really interesting and curious point. And I think the thing to be aware of here is to practice getting in between your emotional response and then your choice as to what your behavior will be. So we call that conscious leadership. The first thing to notice is your response is a signal that you've been um, triggered by this person, by the environment, by the nastiness or whatever it was, whether they've done it on purpose or not, because sometimes these things happen and they're misunderstood and they're mistakes. But if it is on purpose, you notice your response first and then pause and you pause before you choose how to act and then make a conscious choice as to how to act you've basically got two choices you can tackle the issue through your organization through your usual channels with the person just by dealing with it socially um, or you can avoid the situation which might mean avoiding the person generally or leaving the organization those are the choices and I'm going to say to everybody out that has this issue, if it's coming up now, it will probably come up again in the future. So my shout out to anyone there who's a budding leader is learn how to tackle it. And you may need help for that. But the main thing is to choose your response and not just be thrown into it by your emotions. OK, thank you. And I think we've probably just got time for one more question. If you, you have touched on this in, in the presentation, but yeah. if, you, if you are overwhelmed, what can you do? Um, so um, the most important thing to be aware of is that when you're seriously overwhelmed, I mean, it depends on the level of it, but when you're seriously overwhelmed, uh, the emotions are running so strongly, it's almost impossible to function. And uh, it's very, very important if that's the case to take the stimulus out. Um, so there are two aspects to that. One is the environment around you. So, you know, go away. Um, you can go for a walk, you can take a break, you can go on holiday, um, you can not come in, you can take some time off if you need to, you can go to the doctor and get um, uh, some time away from work if that's if that extensive. So get away from the environment and give your body a chance to, um, to have time away and to naturally settle. Um, the other side of it you've got to deal with is your own internal response and so the answer there is to get help. Um, you can go to the doctor, um, you might find that you've got a close colleague at work or at home that you can talk to about it. Strong emotions are never great if they're locked up inside you. It's um, much more important to let them come out and process them in some way. But we can all be fearful of that, we can be fearful of losing control of our emotions, especially when we're feeling like this, and crying, for example, 
of getting furiously angry and just how that looks. It can be shameful to feel like that. Truth is, you know, they're just our emotions. They're completely normal and they do need to come out. And so just finding a safe place with a friend or a quiet space where you can let yourself experience your emotions and let them come out is a good shout. It's a good start. And then hopefully when you've had some help with that, you can find some peace and some space and start to work out how you're gonna tackle it in the future. Okay, thank you, Nick. Well, thank Very you. Well. Okay, thank you once again, Nick. Uh, if uh, I just sort of tell all our listeners that once you leave today's webinar, you will re receive a survey on the presentation and we would appreciate it if you complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow up email within 24 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of the Institute of Leadership and Management and our presenter, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much.